Dear Canadians, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you here from Innsbruck, Austria. My name is Matthias Eller and as part of the lecture series showcasing young Austrian scholars in Canada, I am very pleased to make a contribution today. As head assistant of the Institute for Federalism in Innsbruck, I will talk about the role of federalism in coping with the COVID-19 crisis and put the focus mainly on the Austrian development since the outbreak of the virus. It is probably an interesting topic for Canada as well, because as I know, um, federalism is one of the liveliest discussed topics in um, Canada in general. However, first of all, I would like to begin with some general remarks about COVID-19 and would like to put them in relation to the organization of a state. One could say, irrespective of their state organization, all states around um, the world are struggling hard with COVID-19, which has now lasted several months. They are basically confronted with the same problems. The number of infections should be kept as low as possible, while at the same time, basic and freedom rights should be safeguarded and economic activity without restrictions should be maintained. In contrast, approaches to solutions in the states are quite different and are due not least to the respective state organizational structure. At the beginning of the pandemic, one could sometimes get the impression that the COVID-19 crisis also conjured up a crisis of federalism. In Germany, for example, the so-called Flickenteppich provoked by the federal system was lamented, especially in the media. This expression refers to the different measures taken by the federal states in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, which are naturally at the expense of clarity. In Austria too, voices were raised early on that in times of crisis, a tight control and hierarchical chain of command was needed in which uniform um, requirements were consistently implemented. It can therefore be assumed that with the outbreak of the pandemic in Austria in mid-March 2020, the federal system based on cooperation and coordination was also put to a hard test. And in view of the second lockdown and partly the third lockdown in Europe still is. The scientific discourse has therefore raised not an uninteresting question of whether a central or federal state organization is more successful in dealing with a pandemic such as the one we are currently experiencing. Of course, no generally valid answer can be given to this question, especially when looking beyond the national borders. In the first high corona phase, countries such as Germany, Switzerland and Austria have reacted quickly to the challenges that have emerged and overall performed well. In the USA and Brazil, also federal states, one had to observe the opposite. In these countries, however, the system of federalism was able to compensate in part for the failure of the state leadership. France, on the other hand, a prime example of a centrally organized state, did not perform well in comparison either. If one wants to measure the success or failure of federally 
or centrally organized states by the number of infections. It is obvious that there is no panacea and no state organization that is immune to the challenges of the COVID-19 virus from the outset. Following these general considerations, I would now like to take a closer look at the distribution of competences in Austrian health matters. Therefore, some information about the state structure is inevitable. Austria is a federal state consisting of nine Länder. This is the Austrian expression for region or province. In Canada, provinces like British Columbia or Alberta would be called Länder in Austria. Thus, I will use the term Länder throughout my lecture most of the time. Each land has its own legislative body, the so-called Landtag. On national level, the National Council and Federal Councils, Council are legislative bodies. The competences between the Federation and the Länder are laid down mainly in the Austrian Federal Constitution. To put it simply, in some fields the Federation has the authority to adopt as well as to execute laws. In terms of execution, the Federation often uses the authorities of the Länder. In Austria, we call this phenomenon indirect federal administration. It is a peculiarity of the Austrian federal system. In other fields, the Länder have the right to enact and execute laws by themselves. Furthermore, there are shared competences between the Federation and the Länder, in which the Federation is responsible for legislation and the Länder for implementation. Sometimes the distribution of competences seems to be very confusing, but not in the context of combating the pandemic. In this field, the distribution of competences shows its more elegant side. First of all, it is noticeable, noticeable that there is no closed emergency law which could provide for crisis situations. In addition, the Austrian federal constitution lacks an, implicit, an explicit competence element, disaster prevention or disaster relief. Although the lender are generally predominant in the field of disaster control, the control of epidemics and pandemics is an ex exception to this rule. Responsibilities and hierarchies are relatively clearly defined in this area, which seems to be extremely useful in view of the fact that effective time management is of immense importance in combating any kind of disaster. The federal government is responsible for the area of healthcare in legislation and enforcement in wide parts. The competence public health therefore also includes the defense against and handling of epidemics and pandemics. The organization of hospitals or the community health service, on the other hand, remains the responsibility of the lender. The most important laws regarding the pandemic is the first and second COVID-19 Measures Act and the Epidemic Act 1950. These laws are executed by the lender within the framework of indirect federal administration. This means that tasks that are originally assigned to the feder Federation for implementation under Article 10 of the Federal Constitution are performed by organs or authorities of the lender. In this context, the lender authorities function as federal authorities. The governor of the lender acts as a hub in the indirect federal administration. He is bound by the instructions of the federal government or the competent federal minister and is responsible for implementation at lender level.
This summarizes mainly the content of Article 103, Paragraph 1 of the Federal Constitution. Indirect federal administration is an important instrument in the Austrian federal state for bringing together the enforcement strands of the federal government and the lender and can be an advantage not to be underestimated, particularly because of the integrated handling of different administrative matter matters. However, its effectiveness depends to a large extent on how communication between the decision-making levels functions. In any case, it prevents the federal government from setting up separate federal authorities for each task. This avoids duplication. Moreover, the concentration of important administrative tasks in the district administrative authorities, which are regionally anchored, allows for local execution and the achievement of synergies. They are close to the action and are also responsible for many other issues related to pandemic control, from trade inspection to road policing and administrative sanctions. Consequently, the indirect federal administration requires and promotes a willingness to communicate and the culture of cooperation between the federal government and the lender. Mutual coordinating and being coordinated is not only the basis, but the key to success in the efficient fight against pandemics. The national and regional authorities are dependent on each other and therefore interdependent. The lender, on the one hand, in that the federal government has to provide the legal basis and clear instructions to follow, which in turn form the basis for a comprehensible implementation of these regulations. The federal government, on the other hand, in that the lender have at their disposal the capacities and the general commitment and dedication of the lender in coping with the COVID-19 crisis. It is the lender in particular that provide the corresponding infrastructure, for example, the number of hospital beds and health personnel. Perhaps the most interesting question is now, how Austria responded to the COVID-19 crisis at federal and provincial level and how federalism was affected by these measures. First of all, we focus on the period when Austria was hit by the first wave of infection. The first wave of infection hit Austria with full force in mid-March 2020 and required rapid and targeted action at both federal and provincial level. However, the extent of this pandemic could not be estimated at the time. Therefore, this phase was characterized by a high degree of uncertainty, but also by suboptimal preparation for such a health crisis. Little was known about the virus, apart from the fact that it started in the Chinese city of Wuhan. On the other hand, the legal bases that were supposed to counter a crisis of this magnitude turned out to be outdated, if not antiquated. The epidemic law enacted in 1913 was completely unsuitable for the current challenges and therefore an attempt was made to get the COVID crisis under control with the hastily adopted COVID-19 Measures Act, which came into force on the 16th of March 2020. On the basis of this law, the first lockdown in Austria was finally implemented by issuing several ordinances. Both fear and respect for the novel virus and the horror images that reached the Austrian population from northern Italy were probably the main reasons why the citizens and the public largely accepted, accepted the first lockdown and the associated, sometimes massive restrictions on fundamental rights.
This captor in the hand was clearly taken over by the federal government. In this phase, the legislative bodies, especially the National Council and the Federal Council, remained largely pale and receded into the background. In times of crisis, however, this is by no means exceptional, but can be observed empirically and also in legal comparisons. However, the nationwide measures in the fight against the pandemic, which were also supported by the lender, were more reminiscent of a decentralized unitary state in terms of the mode of operation. The partly tightened regulations in the federal state of Tyrol, where it was not allowed to leave the municipal boundaries for a fortnight, can be therefore seen positively from a federal perspective, as they also revealed a certain flexibility and the use of existing room for manoeuvre in overcoming the crisis. A lack of cooperation between the federal government and the lender was not addressed in the first COVID phase. It can therefore be assumed that, apart from the misconceptions in Ischgl, I guess this place is also known in Canada because of the international media reports, the, the communication channels between federal and state bodies probably functioned largely well in the first phase of the COVID-19 crisis and the spread of the virus could be significantly contained, not least because of this. From a federal point of view, it could be also observed that cooperation between regional for authorities, the so-called vertical cooperation, was strengthened compared to horizontal cooperation. Video conferences between decision makers at federal and state level were held almost daily in order to agree on further steps in the fight against the pandemic. As an interim conclusion, it can be said that the challenges posed by the pandemic have been well met in the first COVID phase from the point of view of cooperative federalism. While the first wave of infection strengthened the role of the federal government and the role of the legislation, it also emphasized the vertical aspects of federalism and underlined the functioning of the district administrative authorities as health authorities. Once the first wave of COVID-19 had subsided, the previously imposed initial restrictions were largely relaxed again and economy booted up. It was also possible to hold and participate in events with an appropriate prevention concept. It seemed as if normality was returning to a certain extent to the everyday lives of the citizens. However, it was already clear to those responsible at federal and state level at this point in time that without an existing waxing, a second wave of infection was only a matter of time and would be unavoidable. Therefore, there could, uh, could only be a talk of relaxation with regard to the low infection rates at this time. On the occasion of prominent decisions of the Austrian Constitutional Court in its June-July session, the federal legislator was also confronted with the need to comprehensively revise the COVID-19 Measures Act. The aim was to create a clearer legal basis for ordinances based on it and ultimately to prevent further unconstitutionalities. In this context, consideration was also given to how the virus could be best contained in Austria. In the end, the decision was made to introduce a corona traffic light system, a mix of central and regional measures, although the necessary legal basis for this was only subsequently created in the Epidemic Act 1950 and the second COVID Measures Act.
With the introduction of the corona traffic light, federalism was ultimately upgraded, upgraded, especially since the decision makers at federal and state level also considered it sensible to counteract different pandemic developments by means of different measures. However, cooperation between the federal government and the lender partly suffered, even in the relaxation phase, mainly due to the partly unclear legal basis for combating the pandemic and regulations based on it. As already mentioned, the federal legislator, not least also against the background of the recent constitutional court judiciary, has ultimately created more clarity in this respect. At the beginning of the second COVID phase, the previously mentioned corona traffic light came into the spotlight. The traffic light system stipulates that the least necessary precautions must be taken with green, while the strictest precautions must be taken with red. Yellow and orange are gradations. The system started with yellow for the capital Vienna and the next largest cities in Austria, Linz and Graz, and the district in Tyrol. Green was set for the rest of Austria. The measures to be taken will be decided by a commission composed of representatives of the Federal Ministry of Health, experts from the Agency for Health and Food Safety, medical experts from universities, and representatives of the lender. Its composition is an example of the functioning of cooperative federalism in Austria. The Commission advises the Federal Minister for Health and makes recommendations. On the basis of its recommendations, the Federal Minister can issue instructions to the provincial governors, who have to implement the instructions by means of decrees for the province concerned or instruct the district governors to carry out such measures, measures in their res respective areas. The implementation of the traffic light system is undoubtedly meaningful, but it must also be regarded as another major challenge for the federal system in Austria. In November 2020, the number of infections increased sharply. Thus, the contact tracing practiced by the health authorities in Austria was ultimately doomed to failure due to their personnel capacities. As a further consequence, the corona traffic light has been switched to red for the whole of Austria. A second lockdown in November and in the first days of December was set to get the situation under control again. Despite the restrictive nationwide measures, regional differentiation was still possible during the second lockdown, albeit only in one direction. At most, additional measures could be imposed by means of a regulation, but nationwide measures couldn't be relaxed. Overall, the cooperation between the federal government and the lender in the second COVID-19 phase can be described as quite good as in the first phase. Although cooperation is not always free of friction and there is potential for improvement, one thing must not be overlooked. Tackling the COVID-19 crisis is an unprecedented challenge of our time, pushing both policymakers and public authorities to the limits of their capacity. Crisis management is also a constant learning, learning process. And learning processes are characterized in particular by the fact that, that mistakes can and even may happen. It is crucial that lessons are learned from these mistakes. Especially when time is pressing, it is, it is important to ensure that communication between the federal government and the lender does not fall by the wayside. Nevertheless, it should be mentioned here that sometimes there is no time for feedback at all, namely when decisions have to be taken quickly and on the spot.
Feedback then inevitably has to take place afterwards. And this is ultimately an unsolvable problem regardless of the state organization. Finally, I would like to highlight the main points of my presentation. The effects of COVID-19 did not stop at Austria's federalistic state structure. While in the first COVID phase, the good com communication between the decision-making levels and thus a strengthening of the model of cooperative federalism could be observed, the introduction of the corona traffic light in the second COVID phase has to be seen positive from a federalist perspective, especially since regionally different measures in the fight against the pandemic were explicitly allowed. Vertical aspects of cooperation as well as new ways of communication have come to the fore. Apart from some tensions, communication and cooperation between the federal government and the lender has proved to be good, although the right conclusions must be drawn from past mistakes. A federal system uh, such as the one in Austria proves to be extremely resilient to a crisis like this one if the advantages of indirect federal administration are exploited. The decisive factor is how to make use of the existing information channels to ensure good cooperation between the federal government and the lender in the future. It is reassuring that, despite individual differences, differences of opinion, both levels have always been willing to cooperate. This is important because the challenges of this, of this crisis can only be overcome together. A culture of cooperation is indispensable. Last but not least, I would like to thank the Austrian Cultural Forum in Ottawa for the opportunity to be part of this lecture series. I wish you all, especially all Canadians, all the best for this challenging time and stay healthy. Bye-bye from Innsbruck.